Dr. Doris Maria Luft Santos Baker is the Director of Masters in Bilingual Education at Southern Methodist University, or SMU. From Brazil to Colombia to Mexico and to the States, she migrated three times, navigating four languages and many cultures. While the experiences she had enriched her life, it made her long for a place to call home, a common problem many of us immigrants have. Once in the States, she completed her education and developed a passion to support English learners through her research. She has many publications on second language acquisition, including authoring and co-authoring few books. She is currently looking into developing tools and assessments in English and Spanish to improve and monitor the academic performance of English learners with or without disability. So if you're learning English or you have a kid that is being raised with more than one language, you want to listen to the entire episode and take advantage of her research, her experience, and the tips she shares. So grab your cup of tea and join me in this episode of Empowering Conversations. Hello and welcome to the Empowering Conversations podcast, a place to get inspired, challenged, and empowered by stories of immigrants who build their success from zero. I'm your host, Mehran. So, Doris, tell me a little bit about your immigration. Take me to the time that you migrated. Yes, yeah. So, I was born in Brazil. And then when I was three years old, uh, my family and I moved to Colombia. And so, we lived in Colombia for 12 years. And then we moved to Mexico. And we lived in Mexico for 10 years. Uh, My parents still live in Mexico. And then uh, I got married and came to the States. And I have been living in the States uh, for 33 years. Uh, Tell me about some of the challenges that you faced across these different transitions that you've gone through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that one of the, which, which I maybe see now as a biggest challenge, but at the time, you know, you just kind of grow up like everybody else, um, is that I really like navigated several languages all the time, every day, you know? So uh, my mom is Brazilian and uh, of course my native language is Portuguese. And my dad is German. So although he spoke Portuguese, he also used German. So, uh, and then when we moved to Colombia, I learned Spanish um, in school. And then I was also in a German immersion school. So I learned uh, in addition to Portuguese and uh, German, also Spanish. And then when I was in fourth grade, I learned English. So English always came as the fourth language, let's say, after German, which I think uh, maybe is a reason for my accent, but I'm not sure. It's just, (laughs) I just have it. And then uh, in Mexico too, the same thing. I mean, I I went to the German immersion school, so I continued with my four languages. And then I did my bachelor's degree there in uh, psychology. And then I moved uh, to the States and did a master's and later on a, a PhD in educational leadership. But I think that this, you know, navigating different languages all the time, in, on one hand, it makes it easier to understand people because I could understand everybody that was around me, usually, if they spoke, obviously, one of those languages. But then it also makes you, um, like, kind of not have a, a true identity. Like, you know, when people would ask me, where are you from? I didn't know necessarily what to say because I left Brazil so early that, it didn't feel necessarily like that was my home country. The other countries I were in, I mean, I felt always very welcome, but uh, it's, you know, you're never like Mexican or Colombian unless you have lived here and were born there and kind of like went through the whole system, the education system. And the same thing here in the States, actually, even living so many years, sometimes you feel a little bit strange, like being American, whatever that means. No. So I think that, yeah, that lack of identity is something that I... Um, I mean, I have experienced myself and I see sometimes the people that I work with, the bilingual teachers I teach or the students might feel too that they don't know really where they belong and they might feel a bit kind of out of place wherever they are because mm-hmm. there's always this other culture behind you, you know, that uh, shapes you and uh, and kind of guides you. And at the same time, you know, you need to juggle it with the realities you know, of where you live. Do you have any tips or ideas. I think that uh, with the years particularly, I've learned to, 
really appreciate all the different experiences that I have had and see the value in them. And so even if something you have had a you know, very um, uh, unfortunate or difficult situation, to see it also as, as a way to learn from it, you know, and, uh, and, and grow and make it part of yourself, you know, instead of um, forgetting. My parents now live in Mexico, so what are, what are the ties that I have with um, that country that uh, will always stay with me, even if I never go back there again? And here, too, you know, like, what is it that uh, ties me to being in the States and being an American. So for so many years, I felt like a foreigner, you know, never really quite adjusting that, uh, that I am actually an American and that um, I live here and for many years and that I am surrounded by people with maybe different experiences than I have, but we're still all in the same um, situation and good examples even now, the pandemic, you know, I mean, it doesn't differentiate anymore, you know, who you are, where you are, but it's really all of us together trying to work it out, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Which transition would you say was the hardest one for you? You know, I think that each of the transitions had points that were difficult. You know, like, for example, I remember going from Colombia to Mexico, which, you know, both countries speak the same language. You know, there's never, like, let's say, an animosity or a difference. But once you move to, from one country to the other, you really uh, realize the differences in uh, the way of talking, in the way of thinking, in the way of doing things. And so it kind of like uh, reminds you, you know, that even though we speak the same language, it doesn't necessarily mean that we act the same or we think the same, you know. And I think that uh, maybe the hardest part was coming from this uh, Mexico to the States, just because obviously the language was different, but also I, I knew I was going to be living here. And so things were going to be changed, you no? Know, and I was married too, so there was a different way of, of thinking about yourself and about others and even your family that uh, was on one hand very hard, but on the other hand, it was refreshing because it was kind of like moving away and trying to start your new life, you know? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, one of the interesting things, and that's sometimes we don't talk too much about, but I think is, is important, is, is the name. You know? For example, you know, I had my maiden name. I had Santos Luft, Santos for my mom and Luft for my dad. And then here, when I did my social security card, you know, I was suddenly Luft the Baker. Kind of my own identity you know, was kind of changed by the name. And because here you don't use more than one name, basically you were Doris Baker, which is not the person that <laughs> I grew up with, with uh, all these different cultures. And they were kind of, in a way, my name, no? Doris Maria Luft Santos Baker. That's the way I always uh, knew myself or people called me, no? And, and so suddenly you are Doris Baker and there's almost like no past. I mean, and for people maybe to understand too that, yeah, I had an accident, I had a different life and, you know, very different from... Um, the one that most of the people I was surrounded with had. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, I was here, you know, trying to adjust and, and belong, you know. So I think that those things are hard, you know, when, uh, you know, there's a different perception like of uh, who you are and what you are and what people think you are, you know. Uh, prior to the recording, you were also telling me about how your parents or your family had different expectation of you. Can you share a little bit about that as well? In my family, I have three brothers. And so when I was growing up in Mexico, all my brothers, they came and they went to study in the U.S., but, but I wasn't. And, uh, and I wasn't even asked if I wanted to go to the U.S. Uh, I, I, I can remember now, maybe I would have said no, but, but I thought it was interesting that my brothers could go. And in fact, it was almost like expected. And I stayed in Mexico, lived at home just like uh, college students do there and get your degree. And then um, later on, well, I, I traveled and I met my husband and then we moved. But the expectations were always very different between, you know, women and, and men, even living diff in different cultures, but you still had that uh, gender difference, you know, that yes. um, was with you. Studies have shown complete assimilation takes up to four generations. Assimilation is a process where one adopts the new culture norms and make it their own. A long process, right? 
but integration, which is the ability to exist with other cultures, can be achieved much faster. Some say up to one generation, and it is a conscious choice. I know many immigrants who either go back because they can't integrate, or they live here for decades in their own small communities, limiting their growth and their children's growth. Dr. Baker shares few insights and how to integrate successfully. So, if you know someone who has difficulty integrating, how about sharing this episode with them? Because we all know how hard this process can be. Did you integrate? And if you did, was there a point in time that you decided, okay, this is the best? That's what I want to do. And I think it was a little bit uh, maybe later, but um, it was definitely uh, once I started studying more. So I did a master's in bilingual in Latin American studies, which kind of gave me still that flavor of, uh, you know, being in Latin America, becoming a Latin American, understanding that past, but then also here in the context of the American culture. No? So I think that uh, that was really pivotal for me to be part of it, you know, where I was learning from my own culture and identity, but I also was adjusting to the new culture. You know? And then later on, with, when I started my doctorals, that gave me finally almost like the confidence, you know, first of all, that I could finish a, a doctoral and then also that I can uh, you know, be successful and, and, and persevere in what I can do and, and achieve it, you know, even... Uh, you know, at a later age, for example, I started my doctorate at an later age after my kids were a bit older and your, your classmates are uh, younger, you know, and so there was always this little bit of a challenge of having to do things a little bit faster because, you know, you're older and so you want to achieve the same things that uh, others would like to achieve, but, uh, you know, the time is shorter, so yeah. So how old were your kids? My son was 11 and my daughter was nine. So they were still young, but, you know, a little bit more kind of like in school, in a regular school setting and everything. And, and for them, I think it was hard because suddenly they didn't see me as much on weekends. And, you know, my husband was taking them to soccer games and other activities. And so it was a little bit think hard for them on one hand. On the other hand, I feel that they also learned to see a mom that you know, was successful, was professional and, and, and was thriving, you know, to also achieve professionally what she wanted. Hopefully that has stayed with them and, uh, as a positive. But yeah, it was certainly uh, hard during that time too. Yeah. How did you manage that? And especially yeah. coming from a different culture, right? I mean, your culture, your husband's culture and what you expected of yourself as a mother. How, how did I overcome it? I mean, sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to know how, how I overcame it. But, uh, but, you know, I think it's that, it's that perseverance or persistence, no? I mean, you, you know your goal, you know what you want, but you also don't want to obviously neglect your family, you know? I mean, that, that's part, particularly your kids, you know, that you sometimes just get so busy. And it's very easy here, particularly in the States, to get busy with so many different things that sometimes you forget also to just spend time uh, with your kids or reflecting or just kind of talking and not worrying about the next thing you have to do, you know. You know, finding time, even if it's, you know, an hour a day or, or time on weekends, you know, of going out and going on outings and the whole family and enjoying each other, and trying to find those little spaces, you not know, those little times that where we can be together, you no. Know? Did you ever feel that guilt? Like, I was raised by a stay-at-home mom. So constantly I have this guilt of, oh my gosh, I'm neglecting my child by being in my home office working, you know, so many hours. Especially yeah. during those times that you're trying to catch up, like you said, to others, right? Yeah, yeah. Did you feel that guilt and what did you do? Oh, yeah. oh, yes, all, all the time. And, and particularly, you know, my parents are in Mexico now and they are older. So I feel the guilt from, you know, neglecting my kids, neglecting my parents, <laughs> neglecting my husband. <laughs> so the guilt comes from so many different places. I don't know if it's also a little bit like the German kind of <laughs> culture too. But for example, with my parents, you know, I try to call them if it's not every day, every second or third day. And even if it's like a five minute conversation, but just to put them to know that I'm there and you know, and I'm thinking of them. Uh, with my kids, we connect. I mean, my, my kids are older now, and so we connect 
via text messages. And uh, when my, um, my son and my daughter were in college, we always made a point of at least once a month, we had to see each other because they did leave home. They did not stay like I did <laughs> when I was doing my undergraduate. And uh, so kind of doing those little things that uh, are very satisfying, first of all, but then also reduce that guilt and you know, all that is always with us a little bit, I think. I don't know if it's a gender issue or this culture and being far away. I, I don't know, but yeah, it certainly is there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and I think what you said might be the, the, the gender issue. Uh, yeah. And what we expect of ourselves, but definitely, you know, I think culture can play an important role. So as you know, most of uh, my audience are immigrants. From yeah. different um, cultures, different countries, mm-hmm. and some did come with kids that now English is their second language. So not only the parent has English as second language, but the kid also yeah. has English as their second language. What are some suggestions that you could provide to these families? Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell me a little bit? Because I know that you've published a book on second language acquisition. That's one of the books that you have published. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Can you educate our audience on that? Yeah, well, I think that one of the most important things is conversations, is having conversations with your children, whether it's academic topics or, or any type of conversation about their families, their identity, where they came from, or things that kids are learning in school, you know, and, uh, and really kind of engage children in more, in deeper conversations. I think that becomes a little bit uh, harder nowadays with everybody having a cell phone, but having those deeper conversations with parents, uh, between parents and children really helps them think through issues that, that sometimes, I mean, there's not a yes or no answer, no, like, there are other components that need to be taken into account, no? And, and the only way you can really think through that and analyze it is really by talking. That's also what schools expect from children. So their expectation is not anymore like maybe many parents have had, which is like write, memorize, and turn in an essay or answers to questions. But uh, nowadays, schools expect kids to describe, analyze, persuade, explain. And so I think that uh, those were things that would really help parents. Now, one is understand what the, what the expectations are for their kids. And the other one is having meaningful conversations with them. And uh, when you say meaningful conversations, do you mean in English or in their native language? Oh, this is a really quite good question and very close <laughs> to my heart too. I think it should be in their native language if that's the strongest language for the parents, particularly w- with younger kids, no? because that's the way the parents can really express themselves. And we know we have also evidence that even speaking and communicating the native language helps kids later on with their own language development. So yeah, no, the conversation should be in fact in the native language or in the strongest language in the family, because what you want is rich conversations. No, uh, sometimes my moms have told me, Oh, but you know, my husband wants me to speak English to my son uh, or to my daughter because you know, we're here and he needs to learn English, uh, but I don't speak English myself. So you know, if you don't speak the language, you can't communicate or have a rich conversation. So it should be in the native language. So the mother can really express herself. Uh, in addition to having, you know, deeper conversations and content and, you know, what the students are doing, is also providing them with a good place to, to study. Because of the outbreak, all of our interviews are done virtually, which poses its own challenges. During our interview, we had a sound issue. I'm sure you've noticed it, or you will along the way. But this one was when Doris was trying to share what other things parents should do beside having a deep conversation. I know the value of her suggestions, and that's why I made a summary for you. One, Dr. Baker encourages the parents to provide a place where the kids can concentrate. For example, turn off TV, reduce background noise, and of course, offer them healthy snacks. Two, learn how the school system works. Whether that's through volunteering or your teachers, you have to know how the school system works here. Three, communicate clearly with your teachers if you are not able to help your school-age children at home. Whether that's because 
your limited English understanding or because you learn the concept in a different way, for example, in math. Communicate that with your teacher. Ask for guidance and make sure the teachers are aware of your difficulty while, of course, doing your own part as well, right? Now back to Doris and the common misunderstandings that happen between immigrants and the teachers. Teachers here, sometimes they feel a little bit like defensive. If, if a parent comes, particularly if it's a Latino parent, you know, they might think, oh, this is trouble. And when the Latino parent just wants to know what to do with their children. No? So there's a little bit of that misperception, a little bit like, you know, when we were talking about misconceptions about who they are and what they want and why do they want that. And, and so, and sometimes because of the parent not speaking English very well, the message might be a little bit kind of aggressive. That sounds aggressive, you know, or, <laughs> or I'm going to sue you or something, even if they don't say that, but it's just a, might come that way and and so teachers are just naturally very defensive which I mean they should not be you know but so it's a little bit of a um, both ways exactly both ways but I think as I say you know for immigrants particularly new immigrants if they don't know how the education system works here it's it's very hard for them to figure it out because it's certainly very different from Mexico and any other Latin American country and I think in general teachers are starting to learn that but yeah you will find some that might feel that parents should know what to do and yeah. you know, they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I've seen many parents who use television as a way to immerse the kid into the language or yeah. use apps. Do you have any suggestions on that? Is it helpful? Is it not? What are your studies show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have done um, studies myself specifically on that. But one of the things that I have found is that most of the games or, um, you know, for kids, they don't allow them to express themselves. No? So it's always that you're clicking on buttons. On one, on one hand, it might help them uh, with learning some words or uh, doing some problems or kind of like developing a little bit like their uh, cognitive processes but uh, without that interaction it becomes really difficult to build your language what we don't know is how much they affect the language I mean there's no research on that really or very little research but maybe what parents can do is then ask the kids like what are they playing what did they do how did they win and kind of like really engage them in a conversation where the kids can become a little bit more verbal about what they are actually doing. And I think that that is what can help them with their English. Yeah, we had a, a study, a very small study too, where we uh, taught the parents how to read with their kids interactively and the books didn't have any words. It was mostly like kind of talking about the book, what do you see, what's going on here. So when the kids liked it so much, they were, they were the ones begging them, the parents to read with them the books. No? So, you know, like all the parents always hear, oh, you have to read with your kid. And well, my kid doesn't want to read and wants to do something else. Well, these children, they really valued that suddenly and they were the ones pushing the parents to read with them no so in a way that's what we want to achieve to <laughs> have the kids be the ones that uh, push the parents to to, to talk as well yeah and, yeah yeah how about adults who want to learn because a lot of um, the audience are of course immigrants you know some have learned english some are still trying yeah, sure. So what the research uh, has found is that, first of all, you can learn a language anytime. So there's not a critical period. People believe that, you know, if you learn the language after seven or eight, it would be much more difficult for you to learn a language. Or you probably have heard uh, many people say, oh, yeah, they're learning language and when they're two and three, and that is the best time to learn a new language. And what we have found is that it's not necessarily true, you know, that, I mean, kids learn different things. And of course, depending on the environment that you're in, but adults can learn a language as well or, or better than, than kids, you no? Know? And the trick there is to really be in, immersed in it and in involved in strong programs and, you know, and, and learn how the language works. Like as an adult, you kind of like use more your, let's say your conscious, you know what, like the rules or the grammar and things like that that can help you understand why the language, we say things a certain way in one language versus another. You know? What I know is that many parents are worried about their accent, interfering with their kids' education. It does it embarrass them. What, what is your thoughts on accent? 
Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if it's, I mean, I'm probably biased because I have had always problems with my accent. I don't let that, you know, overcome me. I mean, my, my children even sometimes make fun of uh, words I say, you know, water, I never know how to say water. You, you know, it's just one of those things. But uh, I, I mean, I feel at least personally, it has never affected you know, my ability to express myself or for people to understand me. I mean, there have been some miscommunications, but I don't think it has been necessarily because of the accent, but more maybe of the wrong choice of words or things like that. And so, yeah, I, I would tell parents to not worry about that and just uh, live with it because that it, it is true that, you know, if you learn a second language later in life, the accent stays. It doesn't mean you don't speak English well or that you can communicate in that second language, <laughs> but you do keep the accent that I don't have in Spanish and nobody ever asks me where I'm from when I speak Spanish or, I mean, even Portuguese. Have you ever had instances where the kids were hesitant to be from a certain culture or they, did, they want to dissociate from that at school or beyond or, you know, high school, middle school? Have you ever had that situation? Yes, yes. I think it's very normal. And, uh, and in fact, my son, when he was seven years old, because I always spoke Spanish to them. I don't know why it's Spanish. They, they asked me now why Spanish and not Portuguese or German. But, well, anyway, at the time I decided to do Spanish. Uh, but he, he told me, don't speak to me in that language, uh, you know, when he was seven years old. And so I told him, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak to you in this language because it's the language that I feel comfortable in and that I like. And, uh, you know, and I want you to learn it. And, uh, and so he was rejecting it at that time. But then when he was in high school, I was speaking to him in Spanish. And then he felt very proud because all his friends were asking him like, hey, what is your mom saying? And, you know, suddenly he became like the center of attention because they all wanted to know what I was talking about. And suddenly he realized the importance of it. And then he studied Spanish in college and went on a study abroad in, in Argentina. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think that everybody kind of at a certain point rejects it a little bit. But uh, I think that the trick there is to just be persistent and to continue valuing it so that they, they learn to value it. And sooner or later, they will do that, I think. You know, and it's sometimes hard for the kids. Sometimes the kids also start losing their native language too. But, uh, but I think that just having that conversation and that interaction really helps them in the long run. And, and it helps them maintain also other important parts, you know, which we talked a little bit before, which is the identity. You know? like I think that seeing that the parents have an identity and, and they value that identity and that culture also is transmitted to the kids, you know, that they should value their own culture and their own identity too. And I think that's important. Was there something from any of these cultures that you learned, but then when you came to the States, you thought this, this that I learned in my Portuguese, German, Brazilian culture, right? Yeah. This is not working for me anymore. This is what I need to do to adjust to the culture here. Well, I think that is a little bit like what you mentioned earlier, that kind of like how to talk to managers or, or to supervisors or to people, you know, or to your boss, you know, it's, it's one of those uh, things that I think I had to learn a little bit. Like, I, I don't know why, I don't recall ever, well, Mexico would be the place where I had my first job, but I don't recall ever having that problem. Here, I did have it to, with several different <laughs> people. And I think uh, it's something that I had probably to unlearn. You know, in a way, I was in an enclosed environment where, you know, we all felt, well, we're all speaking this, all these languages. We have traveled, you know, we, we know well, different cultures. And then suddenly you're put in a position where that doesn't matter really. And so um, it, it's that adjustment not to realize, well, I have to adjust to this culture and to how things are done here. What do you think is the essential mindset that helped you be where you are, because like you said, you transitioned many places, right? Successfully, you went through mm -hmm. different schools and different cultures. You came to the States and resided in U.S. You know, you went to school a little later on after you had your kids. And you're a professor at SMU. You've publish quite a lot of papers, you are contributing to the society, you're contributing to our education system, which is very valuable. What do you think was the essential mindset that helped you 
be where you are today? I definitely think that is that persistence. I mean, really persistence and perseverance. No, I mean, you really need to follow your goal and, and do what it needs to be done to, to complete it. And of course, you know, just like we talked about now, without neglecting, you know, our families and our other personal lives, but, but really, um, really not giving up, you know, and, uh, and now, for example, in this job of um, being a researcher, you're constantly being challenged. Publication gets accepted another one or two other ones rejected. And so you're always in this position of, you know, rejection, acceptance, and probably the toughest place to be in terms of if somebody wants acceptance all the time, no? But you have to persevere, you know? I mean, if that's what you want to do and that's what you like to do, not give up even if, you know, you get 10 rejections, you can still get out there. And if you truly believe in what you're doing, you know, just continue. And I think that's what the message I would give all immigrants, particularly kids, you know, middle schoolers and high schoolers, that sometimes they don't feel... There's a way out of their own situation, but, uh, but they have to keep looking because their opportunities are here. And that's one thing that I think I always valued from the U.S. No, you can find the opportunities. It's just, uh, you know, sometimes they are kind of hidden and, and sometimes even people that are close to you, advisors, and they even tell you that you are not made, you know, for a bigger challenge. Some of my students tell me that, which... It's very disappointing, but, you know, you just have to continue persevering if you believe in it and, and you'll be able to find it. And, and there'll be somebody that will help you, you know, uh, accomplish it, I think. That's beautiful. Okay. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> what is your dream? Well, it's trying to bring the research to practice, you No, know? Like we do research at the universities and, um, you know, we collect the data, we analyze it, we publish, but we end up publishing to in peer review journals. So where other colleagues like us can read them and, you know, and decide whether that's valuable research or not. But we don't have usually the time to translate this research into practice. And that is unfortunate. And, and that is what I think sometimes is happening a little bit that we're starting to distance ourselves a bit more from the school systems and from parents, for example, because not having time to to really transmit this in a way that parents can reach the information and uh, districts can use it effectively, you know, without having to change everything that they are doing. And, you know, it's just hard. I'm the only one that is doing bilingual education research at the university at SNU. And so I just don't have the time, you know, to, to do all of it. Sometimes in our career, we just get to the point that we have so many great ideas but given our situation, we don't have enough time to pursue yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, that is huge in education, I think, unfortunately, because we do know a lot and we have evidence for, you know, what works for which kids. We're, we're just not translating it into practical information for either parents or teachers or administrators, no. Yeah, yeah. but that, that is one of my goals. I, I do hope that, I can start doing that more in the next few years. So I'm not giving up on this. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure you won't. Given your history of persistence, I'm sure you won't. Yeah. And whenever you do, please feel free to share that link or the resource with us because mm -hmm. our audience would definitely benefit from what you do. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doris, for this opportunity. It was, uh, I cannot get enough of this conversation. I could talk with you for hours and enjoy this energy that you have and all the information that you're sharing with me and our audience. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it too. Can you focus on what you want and power through it with Doris's type of persistence? I know you can. You have all the resources that you need. You just need to tap into it and ask for help if you feel lost. And along the way, make sure you continue improving your English and supporting your kids while they are navigating their new languages. If Dr. Baker's advices in this episode were helpful to you, make sure you share it with your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, your Facebook groups that have immigrants in them. Those that are not only improving their language, but also they're raising kids with multiple languages. 
I depend on you, my proactive audience, to inspire, educate, and empower other immigrants. But before that, make sure you subscribe, whether that's an Apple Store, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss a success story from an immigrant. My guest next week is Homa, an inspiring soul from Afghanistan who let go of her dreams because of her family. So stay home, stay safe, and stay tuned. And as always, thank you for listening and supporting our podcast. I will see you in the next episode of Empowering Conversations. <music>